evening. Good to see y'all this evening. We uh, started our, I'll get the mic on here in a minute. I got back here talking and looked up and it was like five seconds. So I didn't have this on there. All right, there we go. We started our uh, study in the Liberty uh, Matrix and I've got some hand, or didn't copy them because we, since tonight we're at the end of the service, we are going to go down, if you'd like to come now and watch, we're going down to the uh, pond that's just right over there, the church's pond, and we're going to baptize uh, Isaac, Venus, and Parker tonight uh, in the pond. So since that, since we're doing that, um, and their family and some of their friends are here to watch them be baptized, I'm going to do a, uh, just a little quick study on repent and be baptized um, out of the book of Acts. Uh, Gary gave me a little... Uh, study guide on it that he was looking at, right? That what it was that he had uh, put together. So I'm going to use part of that uh, tonight, kind of skim it, not the whole thing, because we don't have enough time to do an in-depth uh, word-by-word deal on that. And uh, I know that in in the book of Acts, and if you come on Wednesday night, we're doing a study in the book of Acts, verse by verse, pretty much verse by verse. Um, in Acts chapter two. Uh, there was the, uh, Peter got up, the Holy Spirit came, and, and then he started uh, sharing about Jesus, and, and so that who Jesus was, that Jesus was definitely the Messiah. And then there was baptized, and there was, he told them to ask him what must they do to be uh, saved from that perverse generation. He told them to repent and be baptized. And those two go together. You can't do one without the other. I, I, that's what I believe. You may believe different. I believe the scripture is very plain. Uh, what baptism is, how to be baptized. It's not stick you under water faucet, spit two drops on you. It's not about baptizing infants. A lot of, uh, a lot of the, I know some of the Lutherans, Episcopalians, some of those Catholics for sure will baptize babies. Well, the Bible says you've got to believe. Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch also in the book of Acts, um, he was, he was, they was going along, they saw some water. Let me back up. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading out the book of Isaiah. Philip the evangelist come up on him and he heard him reading that book out loud. They had come to Jerusalem to, to pay their taxes and stuff. The Candace the Ethiopian queen to sent gifts through, through this Ethiopian, the queen of Ethiopia. So he's headed, he's headed back out there. And Philip comes up on him in the desert and asks him, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, well, no. Is the writer talking about himself or somebody else? What's he talking about? And he was reading in Isaiah 51 and Isaiah 53. And Philip said from that point on, so he used the prophecy of Christ out of Isaiah, and it said from that point on he preached unto him Christ Jesus. So he started telling him about Jesus. Well, in that message, the Ethiopian eunuch that didn't know nothing, he wasn't aware of any of that, what baptism was or anything, because uh, it's new uh, in these notes uh, that, that's in this study guide. It says that... Uh, and I wasn't aware of the numbers in the Old Testament. I knew it wasn't ever mentioned. The word baptized is never used in the Old Testament. It's not there. They don't use it. Uh, in the New Testament, the word actually baptized is found 12 times. And then the, two, the word baptized is used 50 times. And so when the, word, when the Ethiopian eunuch saw some water, it's probably just a desert spring or oasis, whatever you call it, he asked Philip, what hinders me from being baptized? Now... I got in pretty upset with a person back probably 15, 20 years ago. I don't know. I'd been preaching a long time, but a few years. We had five or six folks lined up to be baptized. Well, they took it upon themselves to call them. Found out about it. I'd announced it at church, you know, and they do. And then she went to some of them and talked to them. Well, they had, uh, she told them, well, can you, do you have the books of the Bible memorized? Like Genesis, you know, on down through all the way to Revelations. And they said, uh, well, no. But she said, you can't be baptized. Well, they called when we got ready to be baptized. I didn't call them. Didn't know. They didn't show up. Us three short of what was going to baptize. And so I Wednesday night, whenever next time we had church, as a Sunday night was still, I believe it was Wednesday. They come and I said, hey, I missed you in the baptismal search. I said, oh, well, we're sorry. We, we don't, don't qualify, basically. And I said, I don't know what you used. We probably wouldn't qualify. I said, well, what do you mean? You you believe Jesus? Yeah, yeah. They said, well, so-and-so called us, said we, did, we had to memorize the books of the Bible before we could be baptized. And that didn't sit well with me. <laughs> so 
I said, no, that's not, that's false, went back, over. and I'd already talked to him, you know, about scripture anyway, so we got him baptized next week, and I told her that that, and again, use what I'm telling you guys, Philip told that Ethiopian eunuch not to memorize the book to the Bible, because the whole Bible, New Testament, wasn't written yet, it was being written, he simply said this, I'll baptize you if you believe with all your heart that Jesus is, so that's where we term, or coin the phrase, believer's baptism. An infant can't do that. An infant can't believe, right? They don't know. A lot of people believe that if they're not, if an infant dies in infancy or before they're actually saved and they're not baptized, they'll not get to go to heaven. That's not true. The Bible does not teach that in that. So anyhow, that's what we're going to look at tonight. And the, the word, um, the Greek translation for the word baptized is baptizo. And it means to immerse, submerge, or to make overwhelmed, fully wet, that, that, that you go under. And Philip, when he looked at that Ethiopian eunuch, and he said, and that Ethiopian eunuch said, look, there's much water. And it said they both went down into the water. He didn't cup it and drip it on him like a lot of people do. The Methodists are real bad about sprinkling, and again, some of the Catholics are different things like that call it uh, baptism, and it's not. You have to be immersed. That's what the word means. We just... Uh, baptized uh, Jeff's two daughters right uh, Sunday. There's, I saw them. There they are right there. Uh, and then we put them in the horse tank and, and baptized them. Now my grandfather got into an argument with me one time. My mother just walked in. Her dad, he's nuts. Uh, he uh, come to me and told me, asked me if we was baptized, something about the church. And I thought, well, we just baptized. We baptized a bunch of folks one night, 15, 16 people uh, in the new building when we just got it built and just got our baptistry in there, Bill had a big old Baptist. I don't know some of you is probably in the building in town. And the painting that Unigene painted that's in the kitchen now was what was the painting behind the baptistry and stuff. And we baptized a bunch of folks. And he said, "Well, that that don't count. That's that baptism of church. It, it's it's invalid." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "The only way that the valid baptism it's got to be in a river." And I said, "In a river, really?" I said, "Well, what about the because I use Philip and Ethiopian eunuch a lot of what about that?" which he didn't know nothing about that. He just concocted up his own Bible in the way he wanted to see it. And I, he said, well, I said, well, why a river? He said, well, because if you're in a pond, your sin's going to get back on you when they talk you out in the river. And he was serious. He believed that. And you'd have to know my grandfather, he had some crazy ideas on things. He said that river would wash your sins on down. They wouldn't get on you. When you come, when you get back up out of the water. So I didn't even try to convince him otherwise. It would have been a waste of breath and time and all that. The water does not wash or cleanse you actually from your sin. What does? Jesus. But Jesus, the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or cleansing from sin. The water is a symbol of that. And I'll get into that here in just a minute. And it doesn't wash. Philip said baptism is not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but a pledge of a new conscience of being new uh, of being different, and that's what repentance does. But I want to read this uh, uh, out of this. So the Greek translation for the word baptize, here is the word baptizo, and it means to immerse, to immerse, to make overwhelmed, fully wet. The baptizo word was especially prominent in the dye trade, and I had read this, but I had forgotten about it. I, it's, it's been a while. Cloth would be dipped or immersed into a vat of dye. The material was baptized in dye, so it got overwhelmed, it got put down in it. When the cloth was removed from the vat of dye, it had a distinct and new appearance. It was identified in a new way. Red cloth would come out of a vat of red. Red cloth would come out of a vat of red dye red. Blue cloth would come out of a vat of blue dye coarse blue. The cloth was identified by its new color. It had been changed. It had been transformed. Now it had new purpose. So you just took a plain tan, brown, white, whatever you spun the cloth out of, and you put it in the blue or the red. And that's what baptism does. It's a symbol of the key of what Jesus Christ done in her heart, right? First off, we repent, and the repent means to do what? Change. Anybody knows what repent means? Change. Change, go the other way. Change direction. You're walking this way in your flesh. You're walking this way in the world. You're walking this way uh, with Satan, and then you repent. You accept Christ, and so we do a 180. We turn around, and now we walk this way with the Lord. We're new from the inside, but that baptism, I, we can't see the inward work, right? We can't see that. We can't see the spiritual change. In you. Now, I believe that the Bible says by your fruit you shall be what? Known. We should be able to see the change of different attitude and actions and things like that from our lost state to our saved state. But then baptism is also a symbol that we can all see that it identifies us with Christ 
And then it also, it is that sign to the world that now I have died to my sin and I'm coming to newness of life in Christ. And just as like when they dipped these, this cloth into a vat of dye, it changed it into uh, it was red, blue, whatever that it was. So there are two key things we learn uh, from the word baptizo. First, the word means to immerse. Because of debates in the church concerning the mode of baptism, translators have avoided translating, translating it. Instead, they just gave us the Greek word and left it to theologians and, and pastors to sort out the meeting. Some might think it would be better if we would simply use the word immerse rather than the Greek word baptize, for that is what baptism means, to, to, be, to go under. Second, the word baptize signifies identification. What I just said a while ago, it identifies us with Jesus. Newly dyed cloth is identified by its color, right? So if it's just a plain Jane, white, tan, and you dip it canvas and it comes out red, so now we don't call it plain, what do we call it? Red cloth, blue cloth, brown cloth, whatever color that we do. Just like when you dye your hair, you go in there black-headed and you come out blonde-headed, or you go in there blonde-headed and come out black-headed, or, or whatever, right? Because depending on what color, and it changes uh, what it is. So the identifying part of it, Christians who are baptized or immersed become identified with Jesus and his followers. Here's what I don't like about this. This is just me. You can take it for what it's worth. A lot of churches, not all, but a lot baptize you for membership in their church to identify as a church member. Yep. That is not biblical. That is not what baptism is for. So if, when they stand you up there, you cannot find one scripture. And I don't know why Christians have put up with this down through the ages. It's beyond me. They will stand you up in front of the church and vote you into the church. You'll become a member. You can't find one scripture, old or new, that they did that. Especially the new. Even if they've done it, old, we don't, it's, there's no precedence or no scripture. There's no in the new church. Baptism is that identifying mark that the world can see, that we can see, because we can't see your repentance until we've been around you and watched you and inspect your fruit, right? Because it says, by your fruit you shall be what? No, no right? We see by your attitude, your actions that, that you manifest. But we can see, we're fixing to go watch uh, Parker, Venus, and Isaac go down into the pond to be back. We can physically see that, right? We can see that and be part of that. And so, first off, we get the inside change through repentance and Christ and the blood cleanses us. Then we come out. But, again, baptism identifies Christ. It doesn't identify you as a church member. We are a member of the church, the church. The body of Christ. That is the church you need to be a member of, not be a Baptist, Methodist. And a lot of people say, Mike, I don't know why you're so, so jacked up on that and talk about it all the time. Well, I'll tell you why. Here's why. Several times I have went and visited with people that were hooked on drugs, alcoholics, just living out, just craziness, whatever, no fruit in their lives. And talk to them about Jesus. And here was their response. Every one of them. Preacher don't worry about me. I belong to a church. I'm okay. I'm a member of first church. This church. That church. And my response to them is. I didn't ask you where you went as your member of a church. I asked you how was you with Jesus. Amen. Because that's what counts. You can go to church all you want. Just like you can sit in a chicken house. You can sit in a garage all you want, and you'll never be a chicken because you're setting a chicken out. You can eat chicken feet. You can bark, 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 and walk around, peck the ground, and you're still a human being. You can act, you can even think you're a chicken. But the truth is, you're what? You're a human, just like a car. You can go sit in a car and drink motor oil. You can drink 30 weight oil. I don't know what it'd do to you, but anyhow, you can do all that and, and put grease in your hair or whatever and, and suck on an oil filter or blow through an air filter or whatever, and it's not going to make you a car. Because you're in it's the same way. Just because you join a church does not make you a Christian. It makes you what it is, a church member. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to the Father except what? Through me. We've got to come through Christ, through our repentance and our baptism. Uh, when we're immersed and, and we're clothed. The Bible says that we clothe ourselves with Christ and use his baptism as that as well. So. That, that's where we are. A lot of people, again, want to debate that, talk that. There's really no debate in our debate here. It's we're identified with Christ and as a Christian through that baptism. This is evident by the formula Jesus gave his disciples. What did he tell them to do in the Great Commission? Go and share the gospel with them and do what? What did he tell them? 
Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them. Immerse them in that name. He never said in a church name. And that, that's one of the few things that when I was with the Church of God that I did agree with them on was their membership stance and being baptized into Christ and stuff like that. We, we never have, uh, and from year or anything, have membership in the Church of Christ. Some churches are, or excuse me, Church of God. Some churches are now doing that within the Church of God, having membership and stuff and different things, but they'll have to answer to that, not me, so... Uh, whatever. So again, remember, we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son. And if you remember what I said when I baptized the girls Sunday, I ask them, all, I ask them, do they believe that Jesus died on the cross? I ask them, they believe He's in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights, and He arose and He's seated at the right hand of the Father. I ask them if they believe that. And you girl said what? Yes. yes. And then, and then I said, so on the profession of your faith, I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then uh, Brother Mark baptized them. And, and here we go. And I'll do the same thing uh, with Isaac, Venus, and Parker. It'll be the same thing. So again, we've complicated something that's really not a complicated thing. It's, you don't have to have a deep theological sense to understand what baptized or to be baptized is. Uh, if we'll just let it speak for itself uh, in that. In ancient times, a person's name was associated with the attributes and character. To be baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit means to become identified with the triune God who has revealed himself by his spirit in what? In the person of Jesus Christ. We have that physical that Jesus came down and what did Jesus say? I and the Father are what? Are one. one. Right? Just like in marriage. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to leave our father and mother. Husband and wife are supposed to cleave to each other and become what? One. one. We're still two separate entities. We're male and we're female and, and, and all of that. But we together we become one and it's the same way uh, that Jesus was in the Father and in the Son, and then thank God, then the Holy Spirit then legitimizes that, that union. Now, baptism, here we go. Remember what I said? We have to repent and be baptized. Repentance without baptism may not be legitimate. Think about that. Why? Again, what it is to repent? Turn away, change, walk a different direction, right? Because, again, a lot of people, we can't see people's hearts. We don't know if they got mine. This is why I don't like, this is me again. Some guys that come here do it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying people can't get saved in this manner. But when we just say, every head bow, every eye closed, nobody looking around. You want to see Jesus, stick your hand up in there. Well, I never saw Jesus do that. I never saw Paul do that. Peter didn't do that on the day of Pentecost when those 3,000 men, that wasn't counting women and children that got saved, they only counted men. They didn't do that. He didn't say pray or sinner's prayer, did he? Anybody ever saw in the Bible where it says pray or sinner's prayer? Has anybody ever seen a sinner's prayer in the Bible? I'm serious, I'm, this is a serious, anybody seen that? Because I've looked and looked and looked and Googled and researched and went through tons of different commentaries and I've never found it. What I see is Peter saying, repent and be baptized. What I see, Paul, when he got out of jail, remember when the jailer thought that he'd escape and he was going to fall on his sword and all that, and Paul said, no, no, we're still here. He cleaned them up. They went to his house. He got saved. His whole family got saved. What did they do? What happened after that? That very night, what did they do? They got baptized. He didn't say, close your eyes, say no sinner's prayer. He said, repent and be baptized in the, in the, and believe in Jesus Christ. So when we do that, when we just simply do this and, and do the hand deal and all that type of stuff like that, we don't really know if there was a heart change, right? We can take them at their word. Or their Actually, I'm not saying that people aren't saved by that. I'm not saying that their salvation does count. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is true repentance is what the Bible says in the heart, because just like when we're, we're immersed and, and we're raised up out of that in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we're a new creation, identified in a new way. We have a new purpose. We're changed into Christ, just like that material that was died. We're now alive in Christ. So when, our, when we repent, you may be repenting in your flesh or in your mind, but not in your heart. A lot of people get mind saved. I do not like, this is me, and I'm basing this on my experience. I do not like altar calls for kids. Don't like them. Don't like them. Now, I'm not saying this is what I do with children. 
If you want to know more about Jesus, you want to get saved, come visit with me. Because this is what happens with kids. Let's say, Parker, we're at a big event. Parker's the big popular kid in school, big bat. You play football or anything, Parker? Okay, basketball. So Parker's the big stud on the basketball team. Everybody knows Parker, likes Parker, and everything like that. Everybody wants to be like Parker. Parker's in that meeting. Parker gets up, and Parker comes to the altar. We try to scare him. Oh, now, you don't want to die in hell. We really literally try to scare people more than we try to get them to repent, I think, in a lot of deals. So Parker comes to the front to the altar. Every kid in that building will empty and come down here. Seen it many times over. If the popular kids come, you let's say Red. Red's not the popular kid. Nobody likes Red. Whatever. Even I'm, I'm just, just jacking with. But then if it's somebody nobody knows or anything like that, and they come, they ain't nobody going to come. I've seen that happen time and time again. And I'm not saying those kids can't get saved. I'm not saying that. But a lot of times we try to set these things up because here's what churches like to do. Say that again, Gary. Keep score. Keep score. Get our little membership card out. Phil, I'm not saying we should. I'm not saying we should keep track of the disciple. I'm not saying that. Then we turn it into the higher up. We had 59. We had, and then we brag about all the, it's a number, it's a scorecard. Well, the Bible says that your name's got to be written in the land's book of life, not on the secretary's book or anything like that. I'm not saying again, it can't be done. I'm just saying it, it misleads, and a lot of people get mind saved, and they don't have a repentant heart. And then if you just have it in your mind or you just repent in your flesh, you're sorry. Because a lot of times, people are sorry they got caught. A kid's feeling bad. Preacher's been up there talking about you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, you know, whatever. And the kid's saying, well, I'm doing that, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, they get kind of guilty feeling in their flesh or whatever. And so they come down because it kind of scares them. But they really don't have a repentant heart or anything like that, right? And then when they get back at it, there's no change. Why? Because it was only in their flesh or only in their mind. But when it wasn't in their heart. But when we have a heart change, it changes us. We have, not saying it will be perfect because we won't be. But when we come through that, we get identified in that we don't just repent in the flesh, but we repent in our heart. If the repentance is from the heart, there should also and there will be a repentance of the mind. The heart's got to change first. Before the mind, because what the Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. The mouth speaks. What's in us is what comes out, right? And, and that's what this is saying. So, when we have that, when we have that, then there's the desire in our heart now, not our physical heart, it's got four chambers, but, but in our spiritual heart, then there is a desire to change and then be identified with the formula that Jesus Christ gave. What was the formula? baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. That's evangelism 101. It ain't going around keeping scorecards, passing out the Bible tracts, and all the stuff that the church has tried to do. Now, I'm not saying they're wrong. I've done that. Didn't have much success with it. Made a lot of people mad. You go beat on the door at 7 o'clock and get them up from the supper table, and they've worked all day, and then here come 14 people from church down there tell them how sinful they are, and they're all going to go to hell if they don't blah, 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 blah. That was the old way of doing things. Good intentions, wanted people saved, wanted people changed. I'm not saying people didn't get saved that way. But it really wasn't very effective because, look, we are the most churched nation that has ever been. We have more churches per square mile, more churches per 1,000 capita, not 100,000, 1,000 than any place that has ever been right here in America. We are just a few percent of the world's population, and we consume 93% of all illegal and legal drugs. We are more addicted. We are more strung out. We are more divorced. We are more sexually immoral than any other nation in the world, but yet we have more churches per 1,000 capita than any place. So what's that tell us? It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. Because God never intended for the church to do what the church is doing. What God intended for the church was to do was to tell them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and then disciple them and not go out there and argue and fuss and fight with the world like we've done. Boycott in Disney World or Disneyland or whatever because they have gay day or whatever like the Baptists did 
several years back and not buying all this stuff. Did it, did it stop the homosexual agenda? But boy, you know what it did? It threw gas on it and made it blow up. The more people, you're going to do that to us? Well, we'll show you. But what changes that? One-on-one -on -one evangelism, how we live our life every day, how we live in our communities. The church can be active in, in, in every aspect of the community. Not to tell people how to do or how to live, but set an example that they can look at your life. Then again, that you identify with Christ, that you don't identify with the church. And again, I'm not knocking nobody. You go down and look through a lot of people's religious whatever status. There's some will say Christian, but most will put what? Before they go to church. Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever. I'm not saying it's wrong. Again, guys, I'm not trying to down anybody or say that this is wrong. I just want us to get a new way to look and think at this thing to become new because the only hope for our nation, the only hope for our state, the only hope for our county that we live in, we're pretty much split between Payne Creek and Pawnee probably here tonight. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody from Tulsa County here. I don't think so. But anyhow, you know what I'm talking about. In our area, in our sphere of influence is this right here. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And how we act and react and live our lives and do our lives. And to see, it's, we're never going to change this country with politics. Never. John F. Kennedy tried. What did it do to John F. Kennedy? Shot him in the head. Lyndon Johnson, one of the biggest crooks that ever sat in the White House. You don't go look at Vietnam, a lot of stuff goes back. Go, try, go look at that stuff right there. It's crazy Amen. what went on. And it just went, shoo, 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 shoo. and it's going to continue to go downhill. But you know what's going to right the ship? Jesus. Jesus. But guess who Jesus called to be in the boat paddling Us. on the oars? Us. The church. We the people. But it's, we've got to do the basics right. Just like you, you take a, a horse hadn't been broke, hadn't been touched or whatever. Back in the day, there's a couple old time Bronx stompers that when I worked on a ranch in Wyoming that was old, old, old school cowboys. And they was telling me all about marriage and, and stuff one time. Me and Lori hadn't been married very long at all. I went up there and then finally the, the boss, you know, he heard him was, was dragging calves one day working calves. And he come over and, and uh, he said, uh, Bud, Bud and Bill, we called them the two B's, and Bud and Bill, he said, hey, uh, which I would preach down the other way before I started preaching. He said, he said, uh, Michael, and Roger Pilgrim was a rough old cop now, typical old Northwest, Colorado, Southwest, Wyoming ranch. I'd say had a ton of country up in there. And he said, two old men, you know, they'll tell you about me and marriage. I said, yeah. He said, don't believe a word they say. I said, what do you mean? Them two old bachelors, they've never been married. They've probably been on five dates between them. He said, they don't know anything about a wife or a woman or anything like that. But boy, they was handy with a horse now. Them old boys could, could make a horse ride around. But them guys be having problems with the horses, you know, and stuff. And them two old guys like old Calvin, they don't say much. They just sit over and watch and watch them guys. And, you know, kind of smirk every now and then. And then finally someone goes, hey, what's on the horse? Whatever. And he said, well, you're going to have to go back and start over. He don't know, have a clue to what you're trying to get that horse to do. It's the basics. You've got to start at the ground level foundation and build up. And it's the same one in Christianity. This is the very basics. Matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews, it says, I shouldn't have to go on uh, about baptism again, about laying on of hands and all of those things. He said, those are the elementary things, the basis. So if it's elementary, what's that mean? It's down here. It's not higher education like we call college, right? And baptism, to repent, to repent and be baptized is the very basic, is, is the very first step. Once you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is we repent in Jesus' name and we're baptized. That is the very first steps that we do. Because and then be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism, that repentance is not legitimate. Repent, change your direction, change your thinking, reconsider who and where you are, and then be baptized, change your spiritual appearance, and be identified in a brand new way. And where does that identity come from? We become a new creature, new creation in who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Not in the church. And again, thank you guys for coming to church tonight. I, I, I love to see you guys. I love to see full houses on Sunday. And church is important because the Bible tells us, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, right? 
as is the habit of some. And when we assemble together, we love one another, encourage one another, spur one another on love and good deeds. We need to have a community and a family of faith. Yes, but it's got to be built upon Jesus Christ, right? It can't be built upon anything else at all. Zero. Acts 2, 38, 39, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. The promise is for you. So he's looking out to this big old huge crowd that had gathered. Why? The Pentecost, what to hear? There's the sound of a wind coming, flames of light, fire coming, stuff, and everybody's like, wow, what's going on? And he said, this is for you. And here's the good news. This promise is for you and your children. So there's kids, families there. And for all who are far off. If you go look at that, that means for all generations. That's us. That's Isaac, Venus, and Parker that fixed me baptized tonight. He's talking about them too. He's talking about me when I was about. I was a long ways down the, down the road from when Peter preached that, right? We're a few thousand years down the road. But yet he said, all who are far off. Now notice this. For all whom the Lord our God will call. So you see, the church traditionally through the years has tried to talk people or scare people into Jesus. I know Wolf Hunter tell me one time, sitting around a campfire drinking moonshine. I wasn't drinking moonshine, but they was. I had dogs up there running with them. They're sitting around there, and I'm talking about Jesus. One of them asked me about it, and anyway, I told them whatever got done, and, and I end up doing this guy's funeral service. He said, he said, Preacher, I'm, I'm really glad you didn't try to talk me into Jesus like so many people in the past have told me about Jesus have. You just simply laid it out there to me and let me decide. Let the Holy Spirit work on me. So he said, if you can talk me into it, the devil will sure send somebody to talk me out of it if it's just a talk deal. But when God calls you and the Lord knocks on your heart through the Holy Spirit, he, what Jesus said in Revelation, if you open the door, he said, we'll knock. Anybody ever knocked on your door and you kind of picked out the window and didn't like it and didn't even go to the door and you faked, you know, whatever, go out because it was a salesman. You didn't, didn't want to do that? I, I did it. I just did it today. There's an insurance car, something, Fidelity Life out there, and I was on the phone, got a dog barking, looked at the door, and I said, ah, he'll go away, he'll come back later, or whatever. So sometimes we do that, right? But we do that spiritually with Jesus, too, people do. He knocks, <laughs> he makes the invitation. He said, if you'll open the door and invite us in, me and my father will come in and do what? Sup with you, dine with you, right? So he, he makes the call. He makes the knock. I don't do that. Matter of fact, the Bible says what I do is I plant a seed or I'll water. I may plant it. Gary may water it, right? Kelly may plant it. I may water it. Whoever, we don't know. Bible school, Sunday school, all those things are important. Church may have planted a seed, water a seed, but who makes it grow? God. Or it's doesn't work. So when he knocks, we either open up and say, come in, we repent, we're baptized, or we do what? Shut the door in the face, close it, then turn and walk away and be still in our sin. And that is entirely up to us. That it's who that God calls, but it's up to us whether we answer. Now I know, I know there's people out there that believe that there are people predestined to be saved. You can't back that up in Scripture. They get that out of Romans. The word predestination means predetermined. And the predetermined plan of God is that we're all conformed to the image of Jesus. That's predestined. Every believer, everyone that repents and baptizes into Christ and they're in Christ, in their sin, they didn't have a mind salvation, they had a heart change. Every single one of us, the predetermined plan is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. We're not Jesus, but we become what? We identify with who? Christ and in that we become what? Christ-like, right? Amen. Paul said, follow my example as I do what? Okay. Follow Christ. Not follow a church, not follow Billy Graham, not follow whoever your favorite preacher is, but follow Christ. If they're following Christ, good. Yes, follow them and support them, pray for them and all of that, but it all has to be based on Christ. It says that, um, I personally don't believe that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by simply repenting of your sin. I personally don't believe that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by simply being page turned here, baptized. I agree 100%. Peter makes it clear that we must do what? Both. Because he said you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when we do what? Repent and be baptized in that order. It's 
very plain in the Bible. What we like to do is cherry pick. Well, I don't like that, or I don't do this, or our church traditionally hasn't done this. It don't matter what church tradition says. If, it, if you don't have biblical basis and teaching for it, it is a tradition of men. Plain and simple. It can sound religious. It can look religious. It can feel good. It can make you say, woo, and run the aisles. I don't know what it might do to you, but if you don't have scripture to back it up, it is a simple tradition of men, and it will do just that. Make you feel good for the moment, and you'll walk right out that door and get in your car and cuss your wife out and go cuss the waitress out because your food was cold or whatever. It is be mad and be bitter and the whole thing. Why? Because you're running on emotions. Anybody ever operated on emotions? Try real hard not to now because your emotions will get you in trouble. Your motion's like a roller coaster. One minute, you got your hands up, you know, on air like everybody does. What was the old big roller coaster over at uh, the Mute Park, Tulsa? Yeah. It, huh? Zingo, Zingo yeah. You know, there, woo! And some people was like hanging on the deer, like, you know. That's the emotional roller coaster that a lot of times we get on when we live emotionally. But when we live in Christ, righteousness, peace, and joy, and the Holy Spirit's ours, the power of God walks with us. Amen keeps us, holds us, and all of those things like that. So we've got to get off the emotional roller coaster, repent, be baptized, the Holy Spirit fills us, we walk in power. Amen? The dynamos, the dynamite power that God gives us. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, it says, everything should be done in fitting and in order. That's exactly right. We can't get it out of God's order. That's why you don't baptize the baby, because how can a baby repent? Because they can't believe, they can't know, Right? And that, again, a lot of people, again, because that's a tradition because then as they grow up, we tell them you're Catholic, you're Lutheran, you're whatever because that was where you was baptized. Some people call it confirmation. Anybody ever heard that term in church? They was going to confirm a uh, Catholic or confirmed. And I'm not knocking the Catholics. Do not get me wrong here. What I am knocking is the man-made traditions that so many churches have followed and we've not just kept it simple. The gospel message is Simple. Simple. The church has made it hard. The church has complicated it. The church has made people think, that, well, I'm not good enough, or I've got to do certain things, or I've got to clean my act up, or I've got to memorize books of the Bible. Well, I couldn't sit here tonight and honestly probably go through all the books of the Bible. I mean, we did in Bible school because we practiced them, and you got a sucker or something, or you got to, uh, instead of beating on them little sticks, you got to have a bell that actually made noise or something. You thought you was the cool kid at Bible school because you memorized all the books of the Bible. They're great to do. Great to do. I know people that know all the books of the Bible and don't live by none of it. They can go give you Genesis, Revelation, and everything in between, and you ask them, what does Mark 9, 10 say? And they can get in there and tell you. But then go look at your life, and it don't add up. Anybody know anybody like that? Don't say no names, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So again, just knowing it, it's doing it, right? Don't just hear it or know it, but we do it and live it. And so Peter replied it again in Acts 2, 38 and 39. Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39 says, the promise, we read it while ago and read it again. The promise is for you and for who else? Children. It is for children, the Holy Spirit to come. And, what, and who else? For all who are far off. And who would that be? Us. Us. And whoever till Jesus comes back. For all whom the Lord our God will call. So Peter replied, turn around, go the other way, consider where you are and what you're doing, each and every one of you. Then immerse yourself, baptize yourself, be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We become a new creature, identified in a new way, with a new direction and new purpose. When we do this, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then you will prophesy, we see visions, we dream dreams, just like it says in there. All of God's promises are ours, and guess what? God is no respecter of the persons. What he promised me, he's also promised you. I don't get more promises because I'm a preacher. I'm in hell, I'm going to be holding a lot more accountability. The Bible says not many of you ought to presume to be preachers and teachers because you'll be what? Held in a stricter accountability. I don't take that lightly. I do not take that lightly. But here's, here's the thing, though, guys. Are we willing to follow this simple stuff and get out? Which we, we baptize. There's you all know that. It's not a problem with us. But a lot of people is, and then... We throw the little wrench into it. Well, what about those people on their deathbed? 
that can't get they're hooked up to life support or well I don't know if they could probably talk to you but what about those people what about those people they can still repent they might not be able to be baptized but if they have a repentful heart I promise you God will get them there when you get in trouble with baptism is when you reject it and you have that opportunity and it's a willful act of disobedience to do it now everybody wants to go run to the I figured somebody would say it and you didn't we like to use the thief on the cross right what did Jesus tell the one thief on the cross that said hey save us you know whatever what did Jesus tell him this day you'll be in paradise with me. Right? So he didn't get baptized, did he? Right? And that's what we like to go to. And everybody that's anti-baptism says, well, if you feel like it, it's okay. You don't have to. Well, that's a lie. You're telling somebody wrong because you do. But why did he tell that thief that? Because that thief was under the law. He hadn't come yet to this repent and be baptized. That did not start until because Jesus fulfilled the law at what? When he said it is finished. Jesus hadn't done that yet. Jesus hadn't died yet. Once he died then when he was resurrected we closed the book on the Old Testament. Didn't erase it we just closed it fulfilled it just like when you if you buy a, a vehicle normally it 60 months right? That's the normal. There's some shorter some longer things like that. I mean, a lot of people get in that 84 month. Man, I, I, I couldn't do that, but anyhow. But normally it's 60 months, right? 60 easy payments. <laughs> Make it sound so easy. But when we get it paid, it used to, I don't know what they do now, everything probably up online. They give you the little payment book. Anybody remember those little payment books? And then you pay it and you mail it in, which now everything can be automatic withdrawal and stuff. Then you got down and that, that last one said final payment. A lot of times it was in red. Boy, are you happy to tear that out and mail that check in? If we're nowadays, like I said, most it's online or electronic. But we send it in, or you go to the bank if you bought it from the local bank. You go down there and make your payment. And then the, the final payment, you make it. And then in a few days, a week or so, you get that big deal of all the paperwork that you signed, buying interest you was going to pay. And it normally had a big round red stamp on the front of it that said what? Paid in full. Paid in full. That's what Jesus did to in the Old Testament, he stamped, paid in full, no more sacrifice for sin, no more goats getting throat cuts, no more red heifers taking blood and sprinkling, all that stuff like that that they did. Sin was paid in full, the book closed, a new book was open that we call the New Testament, and now we have we're, repent and be baptized. Like in, in the story we said, that was not in the Old Testament. They didn't do that. John baptized the baptism of what? To start it all off, repentance. What did Jesus do? Got baptized, right? Remember John said, I can't baptize you. I'm not even worthy to bend down and untie your sandals, dude. Right? He, it was freaking him out. He couldn't do it. But yet he did. I mean, what did, what did the father say to the son when Jesus was baptized? My beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Be paying attention to what he's going to be teaching. And when we come into Christ and we're baptized into Christ, and again, the people that, that's on the deathbed stuff, don't let people go to the, to the cross and do all that stuff like that. God will deal with those people in their, in their deal because that, their salvation is between him and God anyways. It's not between you and him. Amen. Amen. You know, I, and here's, here's some of the things that when I teach on baptism and stuff, they'll say, well, what if I live in Alaska and it's 88 below zero? And all the water, and I live in a little Eskimo village, and we don't have running water, and we have to cut ice blocks and melt it, and that's why people sprinkle them. But what if I die and a bear comes in there and eats me that winter that comes? I said, well, one, bears hibernate up there in the winter, but that's anyhow, we're going to play games. So we'll go ahead and let's say a polar bear comes out and eats you. Then they're like looking at me, and I said, Maybe they'll baptize the bear dung in the spring if they can find you and then send that up or whatever. <laughs> That's a joke. I said, you're doing hypothetical stuff that don't even need to be. God knows your heart. If you have a true heart, said, look, when it falls out, we'll get baptized. You're good to go. It's the willful disobedience to not do what God says to do. Man's always trying to skirt the issue with the hypothetical and the what ifs. 
We just do what it says. We're not in Alaska. You heard the message, you know. You need to repent. Be baptized, plain and simple. God knows that. God sees that. God keeps. And all God's doing is looking at what you choose to do. It's just like when he knocks. You can reject him. You can go your own way. That's up to you. And the Bible says all those that reject Jesus Christ, what's the deal? They're judged already. They're condemned already for rejecting Jesus Christ. Now, we've condemned people for other things that the Bible doesn't do. That's man-made tradition again. Just like you got to clean up. I had a guy one time, we baptized, sure enough, full-blown hippie. This dude was a bead-wearing, VW bug-driving, peace sign on a van hippie one time. And one of the guys in the church come to me and said, I can't believe you baptized him. He needed a haircut. <laughs> what? What's that got to do with anything? Didn't say repent and cut your hair and be baptized. Right? But that, again, is that man-made tradition. Baptized a guy one time that was tatted up from about right there to every bit of skin I could see on him was a tattoo on him. Had one of the folks in the church afterwards come. This when we was in the old, old building. That's when our baptistry was rotten <laughs> like that. You had to be real careful with where you stood and then end up in the basement. They said, boy, and he had just a T-shirt on. You could see the tattoos now they call what will they call that sleeves whatever both arms neck and all that he said I wish you'd, you'd made him put on a robe or something we used to do the baptismal robes and I hated them things we'd forget them that sour and stink and whatever just wear, grab a pair of shorts and tie them, let's rock and uh, wish you'd put one of them robes on him covered up them tattoos I said why God looks at his heart not his arms God looked at his heart, not his arms. We had two, had two girls that, this was several years ago, got to come into church, and they dressed, you know, pretty skimpily, kind of pretty short skirts and high heels and all that. And they'd always slip in a little bit late, and by the time we'd start the hymn of invitation, they were doing that then, and they'd get up and slip out. Well, one day, finally, one of our upstanding young men come to me, and they got to kind of hanging around a little more and a little more, got talking a little bit, and I always tried to make a point, talk to him, tell him thanks for coming, didn't, didn't know who he was. And uh, he said, you know them too? I said, no. He said, they're strippers. Really? Yeah, they work over at the deal over at Stillwater. Diamond Venture, or what's that, Diamond Valley, or what is that? Diamond something, whatever. Y'all know what I'm talking about right there. It used to be, huh? What is it, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Billy did. That wasn't me. <laughs> it's diamond something, anyhow. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It used to be the supper clip, whatever, on the north side of the highway there. And I said, really? You? I said, man, I wouldn't be sad if I didn't know. He said, oh, I'm, they are. <laughs> then it hit him what he had done. <laughs> he had just told on himself. Then he went, uh, uh, uh. I said, now I know why you don't put no money in the offering plate on Sunday morning. You done spend it over there on Saturday night. He, oh, no, no, you know, and I said, I'm joking. Don't, don't get frustrated here, you know, whatever. And I said, but what's that matter? They need Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then one of them quit coming, another one kept coming. She come down front one Sunday, said, I want to accept Jesus. We said, repent and be baptized. We baptized her the next Sunday. Girl started coming. I'd done her wedding. They moved, I think, gosh, she married us from around Dallas area, Fort Worth, somewhere down there, and moved. Got three kids now. As far as I know, doing good in life. What they are in the world is immaterial to me. But the man-made tradition deal, those girls could have come in long skirts and uh, what do you call them, tall sweaters, turtleneck sweaters and all that, and everybody probably thought they were pretty good girls. Coming to church, you know, sitting back or whatever. But because then, see what I'm saying? God doesn't look at the tattoo, the short skirt, the high heel, whatever. God looks at the heart. Amen. Amen. Because when the heart changes, if there is an outward adornment that needs to change, I believe it'll change. And I believe it'll be the power of the Holy Spirit changing, not me telling them 
how to dress or what to do and where to go and all that. Because what that does, it'll frustrate them, make them mad, and they may never ever come back in, in a church again because we browbeat them about you can't wear that here or there. I mean, I got kicked out of the church of God because I put tucked my pants in my boots and wore a cowboy hat in the pulpit. That was their real big hang-up with me was that because I didn't wear a suit and tie. I've got on bedroom shoe things, what do they call them? Uh, Crocs tonight because I'm going to wear them down there in the pond. What I wear for house shoes. I don't go bare even in my own house. These things sit right by my bed. When my feet hit the floor, they go in these things. I'm taking five steps to the bathroom that my feet are in. Some point, I'm, I'm not a barefoot guy. I can't take, I can't stand going uh, barefoot. I walk down the highway naked before I go not have shoes. I probably, that's all I can, can't afford is shoes. I'm going to have something on my feet uh, in that. So anyhow, it all goes back to the simple, basic gospel message is repent and be baptized but how are they going to know to repent though just like the good news how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news the gospel is the good news that no matter what uh, walk of life you're from no matter where you're at no matter what of that when we come to Christ and we repent we have a heart change we turn around we, we're baptized, we're identified into Christ, we're new, we're a new creature in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come, we now identify in him, and now we're on our walk with Jesus. Amen. Learning, growing, maturing each and every day. And here's the good news, it doesn't have a dadgum thing to do with church. Because there's a lot of people who go to church that aren't baptized, that don't do what this says, and they turn into a man-made tradition. They'll tell you, don't go hang out with those people. Don't go talk to those people. Don't go down here and do that. And, and they'll make the church look bad. You know how many times I heard from the higher-ups in the church of God, well, you're making the church look bad wearing them cowboy boots and stuff like that. I heard that a bunch. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder how that it took John the Baptist and goat hide and camel hair and big old beard and bug guts and honey. You know John was a mess. You ever tried to eat honey and not get it all? I mean, I can't. It's all in my goatee and stuff. I mean, it'll get all over you. He ate locusts. Locust. Yeah. I ain't never ate a locust. I've ate a few grasshoppers here and there, but I don't believe in... They probably pretty crunchy and nasty. You might get a little locust gut on you. I don't know what. I know my wife don't like them. You put them on her, she wigs. If you put a June bug or a locust on her, she goes ballistic. But Amen. God looks here. Amen. Amen. God looks here in the heart. Amen. There's only one way to get your heart right. That's have a repentant heart. Then when we repent and we're baptized, then the Holy Spirit comes. Amen. Then we have the power. That's, that's the difference maker. The blood, we got to have it because God's not going to put his spirit right in a dirty vessel, right? Because if you got an old, most people, well, some don't care. If you got an old, dirty, moldy, nasty cup or whatever or plate, most people's going to do what before they put their food on? Clean. Wash it, clean it, right? If it's got hair, fly guts all over to whatever, got somebody else's hair stuck all over it and, and everything, you're going to do what? Clean it, right? If you, anybody ever been in a restaurant and, you, you know, you're blonde-headed and got short hair and you pull a black hair about that long out of your out of your suit, what normally do people do? <laughs> you know, whatever, right? So we want it clean, right? And that's what the blood does. It cleans us. Amen. Cleans us. Amen. Then we're baptized and God puts that Holy Spirit in that clean vessel. That's why I said you don't put, you don't put new wine in what? No wine can use that illustration. We got new because the blood won't handle it, won't take it. Then that Holy Spirit was the difference maker. This same Peter, this same Peter that denied Christ three times just a few short weeks back from when he preached this message changed at that point. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Philip, all those guys that were cowering in the upper room, that were scared to death, they was coming to get them, changed and now went and preached. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. That's our power source. Church is good and great. We need to come to church. We need good Bible churches everywhere. Don't get me wrong. But as we already established the fact, we have more churches. Oklahoma's in the top five states of, of churches more than any other state. 
You get to some of the bigger states, and there's not a lot of churches in, more than in the big population. I mean, we, as you know, I haven't counted lately, but at one time, Yale had 13 churches. And 1,000 people, 13 churches. Now, there was three or four of them in house churches and, and stuff like that, but they had church signs out front, and there's five, or six, seven people in them or whatever because somebody got mad and went on, and they got mad, and before you know it, you, you split up. So I don't think church is the answer. How many times have I told people you just, I mean, I'm not saying you have, but I've heard, if you, and I've heard people say it, and if I know them, I say, don't say that. If you just go to church, your life would get better. Go to Jesus. I'm not saying church can't help facilitate that change, but it didn't say repent and go to church. It didn't say get baptized in church. It said repent and be baptized into Christ. When we see that sacrifice that Jesus done. Amen. He didn't want to do it. You ever read about him in the garden get that so many? Lord, take this cup from me. Dad, I don't, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I don't want to do it. To me, to me, that is the greatest pointer that points to Jesus' humanity. Amen. He'd have went in there and said, I'm ready for that cross. Lay it on me, Daddy. I said, that boy's got some issues. He wanted, what's them people that like pain? That There's a name for them, huh? Sadistic. Yeah, yeah, sadomaxis. They like to put hook in. Because that cross was painful. That scourge is going to be painful. He said, I don't want to do it. But, not my will, but yours. That shows the humanity. There's other instances, but to me, that's one of the greatest ones. Jesus said, but I won't, but your will be done, not mine. He asked the disciples to pray for him. What'd they do? Sleep. Wore out. Ah, oh, this another one of them late nights. Jesus is down there doing whatever he does when he slips off from us. Not my will, but yours. And when we identify in Jesus and our name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, doesn't matter what this world tries to throw at us. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ. Who loved us. That's our identifying mark to the world. It's not wearing cross necklaces. I've got leggings with crosses on them, all that. So they're all good and fine. I've got them. Got a saddle, got one carved in the back of the kennel. Good and well and fine. Great testimony to them. Great, great opening line to get maybe somebody thinking about Jesus. But it all goes back to the basics. Have you repented? Have you been baptized into Christ? If you haven't, I would encourage you, I would pray for you, and I would love to baptize you into Jesus. If I can't, we'll get people that can. If I'm gone, we'll make it happen. It might be in the pond, it might be in the horse tank, it might be wherever, but we'll get it done in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Uh, a couple announcements. If you have offering, you can put it in the church. There's a little church house on that barrel. You can put your offering glad over there they are. Uh, put your offering in that. Um, we had our church work day Saturday. We're going to have another church work day August uh, 7th, that Saturday before Bible school. We're going to do that at 6 o'clock to get out of here by 8 o'clock just to touch it up. And then afterwards we'll weed it again if we have to just to spruce everything up for the freedom celebration that night. Bible school is August 6th and 7th. Uh, there's a, a list back there, some uh, uh, items good they're going to send to our troops overseas. If you'd like to help with that, uh, if you bring it, I know Gary and Judy brought some stuff tonight, you can just put it there in the kitchen and Karen will get that taken care of. But they're taking that up. They're going to send some care packages over to our troops. Uh, that's going on, and they're, they're going to do that for Bible school. Um, also, Hunter Irwin, talked to Hunter today. He'll not be here this Sunday, but next Sunday, August 1st. He'll be in both services, and then he'll be with us Monday night, uh, August 2nd. And we will eat that Monday night, August 2nd. We'll have a dinner like we do when we have somebody in. So uh, Monday, August 2nd, Hunter Irwin will be with us uh, in service in the Freedom Celebration, August 7th uh, at 7 o'clock. We've got Bible school till 4 that morning. There's paper back there. It gives all the time. A little flyer. If you'd like to take one, they're on uh, the back deal there. So we'll dismiss with a word of prayer. We're then going to go down to the pond, and we're going to baptize uh, Isaac, Venus, and Parker. So I'd love to have you guys come down there if you can. If you can't, that's fine. But we'll be just going right down there to the pond. You can drive down that little dirt track down there if you want. Uh, it's 
you can get down the car. It's got a little cup of wash spot, but a car, a car will get through. That ain't that, but Billy's kept that filled in good. So you can drive down there if you want, uh, and we will baptize there. And you can ride down there uh, with me if, if you want to in the mule. We can see about four people in that if you want to go down there. Not a mule, a Kawasaki mule, not a four-legged uh, mule in that. So we'll be driving it down there. So if you guys uh, need to change, you can change up here uh, if you'd like. So by either building, you can do that. And then we'll go down there and baptize uh, Isaac, Venus, and Parker uh, in that. So hope Wednesday night, Bible study right here. We're in the book of Acts that I read through off of that study. Uh, on that, if you'd like any of this study, it's a good. I, there's a lot more uh, in-depth stuff I kind of skimmed for time's sake. We can make some copies of that. Uh, and you can have that if you'd like uh, in that. So God bless you. Wednesday night, adult Bible study, 7.05, uh, right here in this building. We kicked out. Kids get out here right at 7. Little kids, they, they're not in here in that building, but they line them up there to get them on the buses and get, get go down to make sure we got the right kid on the right bus on the right route. So uh, we kick off a little after 7 on that on Wednesdays. Love to have you guys come uh, be a part of that. So uh, God bless you. Uh, Unigene Carter's uh, funeral service is Friday at 1030 right here in the building. And they're going to, uh, Barry will be up at Lawson Cemetery north of Yale. And then there are the families coming back here for dinner. And it's going, there's a lot of family. Uh, so we'll need some help with serving. We've got the food uh, covered uh, right there. We don't need dessert, nothing, right? All that's good to go. Okay. So we just need servers. If you don't mind serving, probably eat, probably not going to be right at noon. Probably not, probably going to be 1230 before we get back uh, up there. There's a lot of stuff they're doing in this service. So the service is going to be a little longer than a normal service probably. Then by the time we get back to town, get north of town, do the uh, burial, and then get back here. So you're probably looking at 12.30 dinner. So if you can help with that dinner, we'll need some help serving if you can come on Friday uh, and help serve uh, that dinner. All right, if you would, please bow with me, and we'll close with a word of prayer, and we'll dismiss. We'll go down to the pond and, and have our baptismal service. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercies that are new each day, Lord. And thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us, and you're always there. Uh, Lord, and we thank you for that. And thank you for uh, the, just the, the simple, basic gospel message. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And to his death, burial, and resurrection, Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified. And, and that we would do that and share with people about the change that we need to make in Jesus. And then uh, to be baptized into him and be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk with the Spirit of God. Be led by the Spirit of God each and every day of our lives, not just when we're in a building we call the church, but we are the church, that we're, we're the temple of God. The Spirit of God lives in us, not in a building, not in a box, but in us, Lord. And we're a royal priest to the holy nation, joined and fitted together in Christ Jesus. So again, we thank you for Isaac and Venus and, and Parker that's getting baptized tonight, and, and we thank you for that, that they've come to identify with Christ, uh, Lord, in, 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 in their life, Lord. So we just again thank you and praise you with our nation, with the leaders of our nation the leaders of our state, the leaders of our counties, our towns, our cities. Uh, I know there's uh, one of the churches in Cushing had a had an outbreak of COVID in it, and it's got quite a few of its folks uh, not feeling good. Thankful nobody's in the hospital and, and all that, Lord. So be all the fear that's being spread around, all that COVID deal again coming. But, Lord, help us to stay strong in you to... To, again, to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves, just like your word teaches us. So, again, thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We're going to.